So today we're going to be talking about CQ University as a social enterprise. It's very exciting for us to be talking about this in, uh, in this format for the Festival of Change. So my name's Steve Williams. I'm the Social Innovation Programme Manager at the Office of Social Innovation um, and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, work and learn and pay my respects to First Nations people and their elders past, present and future. Today I'm joining you from Brisbane or traditional name of Mianjin, uh, the home of the Turrbal and Yagara people. We're going to hear from three experts at CQ Uni today. It's uh, really exciting for Chris Farrar to join us, the Associate Vice President for South East Queensland and Director of Strategic Eng Engagement. Welcome, Chris. We're going to hear from Deb Friel, who's the Manager for Centre for Pro Professional Development in the Learning Design and Innovation Directorate. Deb's going to talk to us about professional development at the uni. And Associate Professor Olav Muehrlink, welcome Olav, welcome Deb. Uh, Olav is Head of Course uh, in Sustainable Innovation at the School of Business and Law. And Olav will be talking to us about research at the uni. But we'd really love to hear from you as we move through the webinar. So please, if you do have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, and the panellists will endeavour to provide some answers at the end. And remember that you can upvote for your favourite questions. So please do um, get engaged using the Q&A function. So as I mentioned, this webinar is about CQ Uni being Australia's first and only social enterprise university. Um, now, that certification has come from social traders who are the intermediary between buyers and suppliers in the world of social enterprise. And it really does reflect the additionality that's been built into our educational model at the uni and how it relates to social value creation. It's a whole of university approach, um, a whole of university approach to social innovation. And this is what's really important. Social innovation and social impact really is at the heart of everything that we do here at CQ Uni. Um, and today we're going to hear from the three leaders that we spoke about on their dimensions, on their expertise, areas of expertise in social impact and how that's contributed to the university becoming Australia's first and only social enterprise university. But first of all, I'd like to very briefly just speak to you about social innovation and enterprise at the uni from my position here in the Office of Social Innovation. You know, we define social innovation here as engaging with our communities to address entrenched social issues. We love this definition because, you know, it's an action and it's a philosophy. And we really do place people at the centre um, of designing solutions to the problems that they're, they're seeking solutions for in our work here. You know, when we're thinking about these complex challenges that are happening across the globe, we really do have four options. We can explore new or novel ways of doing things. We can improve what we're currently doing. We can change nothing or we can actively continue uh, along the path of doing more harm. And social innovation sits really nicely in between uh, number one and two, you know, exploring new and novel ways of doing things and improving what we're doing, you know, making tweaks on existing solutions or existing systems. You know, we say that social innovation is about, you know, building and fostering these attitudes and capabilities because we're really interested in how our work with students and our communities and our staff really does contribute to creating the change makers of the future. And another definition of social enterprise, you know, maybe a slightly more academic uh, definition is that social innovation is about new ideas that work to address pressing unmet needs. But remembering that these innovations, they, they have to be social both in their ends and in their means. That's a crucial part of the work that we do here. Now, in the Office of Social Innovation, we work to uh, design solutions for a better tomorrow, we like to say. Um, and we do that across three different domains. We work um, 
on social impact projects with people across these things like co complex collaboration, working in design thinking, uh, using different tools and methodologies such as the theory of change with communities. We work in social innovation capacity building with people. So whether that's through education, through real life experiential innovation studios or design challenges and sprints. And we work ex really extensively in social enterprise development, whether that's through our iActivate cohort, our online social enterprise courses, or whether that's through social enterprise education that happens at the university. What is a social enterprise, you might even be asking yourself if you don't know already. Well, a social enterprise at the most basic definition is a business that operates for a social purpose. The Queensland Social Enterprise Council used these kind of four um, markers for defining a social enterprise. They say that a social enterprise is a business with a social, environmental or cultural purpose. They have a clearly defined solution that benefits people and planet. But like a normal business, they trade to derive their income uh, and they reinvest their efforts and resources into their purpose. I'd like to just take a break just for one minute to show you a video about social innovation at the university and how it really has been embedded across 90% uh, of our courses here at CQ Uni. And this might give you an idea of the breadth and scope of social innovation and enterprise here. When you look at our cities and our regions, what do you see? A way to make beaches more accessible, to follow ancestral wisdom, to protect ecosystems and revitalise native bee populations, or a way to create an Indigenous health plan with Indigenous minds at the helm. Do you see new ways to turn plastic into fuel, to reduce waste and create means and jobs for people doing your task? Or do you see ways to improve ocean health by nurturing seagrass? At CQ University, we see it too. In fact, we've seen ways to support social innovation for decades. Today, it's not just part of our culture, but our curricula. As a changemaker campus, we're equipping minds with the capability to see and find solutions today and tomorrow. And as a partner, we're leading and supporting industries to create projects and practices that enrich our communities. See your way to create change. Become a CQG change maker. So we're going to hear from our first speaker now. So from Chris, Chris Farrar. Chris is a, a skilled and a passionate senior leader with more than a decade of experience in the higher education sector. And as Associate Vice President of the Southeast Queensland Region and Director of Strategic Engagement at CQ Uni, Chris is responsible for the university's operations in the greater Brisbane region, as well as having national oversight of communications, alumni relations, philanthropy, and social innovation. Prior to entering the higher education sector, Chris held a number of senior positions in journalism, media relations, and corporate comms across the private and public sectors in Australia and internationally. Chris holds an Executive Master of Business Administration, a Bachelor of Communication, and is graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, a qualification he's put to good use through a number of education-related board and committee roles. Welcome, Chris. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everyone. Uh, that bio was a little bit fluffy. I'm sorry. I probably wrote it, but uh, I might I might revise it based on uh, hearing it um, firsthand. So um, thanks for coming and uh, thanks for having me to speak. Um, the TB campaign that Steve has just shared with you, I think is really interesting because that's our main recruitment campaign for this year. And the fact that social innovation is at the centre of the campaign um, shows that it's really central to our identity as a university. It's not something that happens on the fringes. It's something that is embedded and ingrained in the DNA um, to the point where we're actually putting it up as, as sort of central to our branding. So I think that's that's really instructive and sets the tone nicely for what we're talking about today. 
Um, just, I guess, as an observation as well, yesterday here on the Brisbane campus, we hosted a live Zoom link with President Zelensky of the Ukraine, which was uh, organised via ANU. And as a university that has a lot of students who are studying by distance or mixed mode, um, also we're in the midst of people still choosing to study and work from home. Um, we had a massive turnout uh, for people in person on campus to, to watch that event, uh, about 70 plus students and staff. And to me, that actually speaks to our students and uh, because it was a majority student population and it speaks to the fact that they are altruistic, they, are, they do want to make a difference, they are driven by these causes, they are passionate about seeing positive change in the world. So to see that proof in the pudding is really uh, is really uh, fantastic and uh, hope to see more of it um, as we continue on this social innovation and social enterprise journey. So I'll tell you a little bit about what's happened. So CQU has been certified as a social enterprise, as Steve said, and that's by an organisation called Social Traders, which is Australia's preeminent uh, group that, that certifies companies and businesses as social enterprises. Uh, we are the first and to date only Australian university to have this honour and it's something we really wear as a badge of pride. So Social Traders is a, an agency that connects social enterprises with business and government members and they support procurement that creates a positive impact. So what that means is that we are actually, as a university, on that preferred supplier list of companies or organisations or businesses who are socially innovative in nature and who government and business clients who wish to procure services and goods from social enterprises, they can actually get that from us. We're on that list um, and we are, um, I guess, counting towards their social procurement KPIs, which is really incredible. Uh, what that also means for us as a university is we actually have social procurement embedded in our KPIs as well. So we as a university are purchasing goods and services from social enterprises and other businesses out there are purchasing goods and services from us as a social enterprise. So it's a really circular thing and, and that's really great to see. The definition of a social enterprise, according to social traders, is a business that trades to intentionally tackle social problems, improve communities, uh, provide people with access to employment or training, and help the environment. I hope you'll agree. I think these are all attributes that the university does embody or at least aspires to embody. And I think the fact that we uh, we, we fit that bill quite neatly um, shows that we do deserve to be there as a social enterprise. So we applied for this social enterprise status back in June 2021. Uh, that was a bit of a process in terms of providing financial and strategic reports, um, providing data that demonstrated our social impact in a tangible way. And we also had that reviewed by an expert industry informed panel who really knew what they were talking about and made sure that we were a legitimate social enterprise. Um, we we're really happy to see the certification come through in December last year. And uh, within social traders, we are in really good company. Some of the other social enterprises that are certified uh, by social traders include companies like Who Gives a Crap? You might know them as a subscription-based toilet paper social enterprise, very uh, very topical in this day and age. Um, Land Care Australia, who most people would be familiar with. Um, the Thank You Group, so they do the Thank You Water and Thank You Soap and, and, and other items. Um, and there's hundreds more, hundreds more social enterprises who fall under that banner of, uh, of social traders. So really in great company and, and good to be the only university in the mix of that. Uh, Steve, could you change the slide, please? So uh, what makes CQ a social enterprise? I just talked a little bit about the criteria earlier, um, but in terms of how we actually uniquely fit the bill, you could say that CQU was arguably already a social enterprise. This certification really just makes it official. We are a social enterprise because we create value for our communities. We have a public purpose. We provide a community benefit. And the social impact of our education, training, student support, student empowerment, our impact-led research and our life-changing community engagement and investment all add up to making a, a social enterprise. And in assessing our application and providing us with the certification, social traders cited the following reasons for granting us that status. Uh, they said that we, uh, as a university, lead inclusivity across higher education by removing barriers to entry for historically disadvantaged groups. I think you'll agree that is that is accurate. 
Uh, they said we had a whole of university approach to growing and integrating social innovation, which uh, is obviously something that we're we're on the path with, and and uh, I think that definitely uh, gets the box ticked as well. Uh, they they cited the fact we had a commitment to embedding social innovation in the curriculum. And Steve recently shared a statistic with me, which I think was something like 85 or 90 percent of um, courses now have a social innovation component, um, which is really stunning. And I think uh, it can only improve from there. Um, our sustainable regional development and engagement agenda is core to our mission. That's another thing that social traders cited. Um, we had a dedicated office of social innovation. Uh, which not a lot of universities would. Uh, we have a First Nations focus, and you'll know that we just uh, embarked on our latest uh, wrap uh, in, in recent weeks. And we have a social and Indigenous procurement KPIs, targets and activities embedded in our strategic plan. Uh, next slide, please. So you might ask, why would we do this? What are the benefits of uh, adding this feather to our cap? Well, I think there are quite a number of benefits. I'll try and go through some of them for you now. So social traders, as I mentioned, are engaged with a whole host of businesses and government departments right across Australia. And those businesses and government departments are engaged with social traders because they have social procurement targets. So CQ is on the list of social enterprises that these businesses and government departments can procure from. And uh, they'll recognise any, any dollars spent with us as, as uh, counting towards meeting their targets. For the university, um, it's great to be in good company there and to be recognised as a leading provider of those goods and services. But at the same time, it is an additional revenue stream for the university. And certainly in this post-COVID environment, well, you could argue if it's post or, or um, <laughs> post-COVID or, or, or uh, we're, we're in the midst of COVID, but um, in this post-COVID environment, uh, diversification of revenue streams for universities is um, really high on the agenda. And so for us to have this avenue is, is yeah, just another way of making our, our operations more financially sustainable into the future as well. Um, now, I think the fact that we are the only university currently in the mix makes us a little bit of a unicorn because we can become uh, quickly known as the, the preferred university supplier in the social innovation space. I would say that there are a lot of universities who are nipping at our heels in this space. Um, it's a very desirable space to get into. And I know there's one prominent university in Queensland who uh, used Changemaker as, as part of their, their slogan. And that's that's something that we've aspired to as well as making our students change makers. So that's not a criticism. Um, I actually think it's really, it's really important. And you'll know that we, as a university, are uh, Ashoka U certified as well. So Ashoka U being the preeminent higher education organisation looking at social innovation. Uh, we are a change maker campus under Ashoka U. And, um, you know, part of the discussions that we had recently, so Deb uh, brought me in on a discussion with one of our colleagues in Canada. And, um, you know, we, we have this notion of we're the only Ashoka U university in this part of the world. Um, in North America, you know, there's this desire to get this groundswell of people participating and bring other universities into the into the fold and propagate the social innovation message. So while it's nice to be the only change maker, while it's nice to be the only um, social enterprise, at the same time, um, we won't always be the only one. And it is good to be maybe a first mover, but to prompt other universities and similar organisations into action and really spread this bug of social innovation. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, we can take pride in being a first mover, but I think we've got to recognise that the space will fill up and, uh, and, and encouraging people and making more people aware of, of social issues and the good they can do in the world is, is only a good thing. So, um, so I look forward to, to seeing that groundswell build in the future. Um, why would a business buy from us is maybe a question that some of you would ask. Now, so obviously our core product is uh, education and training. And so courses are a form of goods. And, you know, we do have some social innovation specific courses, um, such as the I Activate course, for example, or the I Change course. Um, but equally, we have courses that have social innovation embedded within them as well. So um, obviously, education and training is a core product. But if you think about it a little bit more laterally, um, we actually as a university are very diverse in terms of our research expertise, our teaching expertise, the knowledge we hold, the experience we have. So we can help clients solve complex problems. We can build the capacity of social enterprises. 
uh, and we can teach social innovation processes and practice. So I think if you if you think about the landscape out there, you know there are very few organisations that are set up to do that, and um, and we are one of them. And so you know those goods and services are quite unique in the market, which is great. In terms of the concrete products and services we offer, obviously education and training is one, but also consulting, also facilitating co-design. Uh, and also nurturing social enterprises who might need that leg up and might benefit from our experience in terms of their entry to the market, in terms of marketing themselves, finding product market fit, finding customers, et cetera, and also understanding how to balance um, the, the, you know, the sort of the commercial and the, and the, the more altruistic side of their, their operations. So all of that um, is really stuff that we can offer and we have been offering and um and so uh, i think there are a lot of businesses and organizations out there that can benefit from what we have right here so we've embarked on a lot of past projects uh as a social innovation unit and as a university um just a few one is a, a zero waste circular economy project with rockhampton regional council um, we also built a um, we had a social enterprise capacity building uh, activity with queensland social enterprise council We've participated and facilitated a youth homeless shelter hackathon in Gladstone. Um, we've participated in a social enterprise ecosystem development project in the Central Highlands. Um, currently, there is activity going on as well. So Steve, uh, who is comparing our session today, uh, he's working on an iActivate program, which is being rolled out in a hybrid face-to-face -face and, and online model um, to 48 enterprises across Rockhampton, Bundaberg, Toowoomba and Cairns. Um, and that's been funded by the Queensland government and we were the flagship recipient of some recent social innovation grants that they announced. So that's very exciting. Um, also, and if anyone is on the line and is in Rocky or Bundy or Toowoomba or Cairns and you have somebody in your circle or you yourself are interested in embarking on this social innovation journey uh, personally or for a business you might be, uh, you know, side hustle, whatever it might be, um, please do look up that iActivate course. These are free places in, in our excellent iActivate course. And uh, you can go ahead and enrol and you'll learn a hell of a lot. And uh, it's all it's all government subsidised. So I really encourage you to, um, to seek that out um, should you be interested. Um, we've also got a National Career Institute grant. Um, our project is called Reframing Our Future. And it's aimed at women. It's aimed at helping women get back into the workforce after a large period of uh, either being outside of the workforce for, for whatever reason or seeking a, a change of career. That's all subsidised for participants as well. I know we've already kicked off the first cohort of that and it's a really exciting project. Um, and I got word today that we might be looking at um, yet another social innovation project uh, that would be externally funded as well. So there's a lot of activity happening. It's a very exciting time. Uh, Steve, my final slide, please. Thank you. So how does all this, I guess, commercial activity fit with social innovation at CQU? You know, we've talked about consulting, we've talked about capacity building, we've talked about projects. Um, honestly, I think it's a maturation of our holistic social innovation offering across the university. You know, we've had in the past change maker opportunities for students. We've embedded social innovation in the curriculum, as I mentioned. We've got our signature social innovation short courses. Um, we've got the Festival of Change, which we're obviously participating in today. And uh, we've been engaging with the social innovation ecosystem. So this more commercial focus um, and, and this status as a social enterprise is really a, a maturation of, of the journey that we've been on for quite a long time. And I think it will open up CQU to some really new and exciting opportunities. So thank you. I've probably taken up way too much time after a late start, but. Uh, I'll hand back to Steve. Thanks, Chris. That's great. Um, and just to let everybody know, there will be at the end of this webinar, there'll, there's a QR code for people to get more information on the iActivate course, um, particularly in the regions. So next up, we're going to hear from Deb. So Deb Friel is the manager for the Centre for Professional Development and is responsible for our short courses and micro credentials here at the uni. Deb's a passionate advocate for sustainability and is an alumnus of Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Corps, which must have been a very exciting thing to do, Deb. Um, and she's also passionate about social innovation and represents Seeker University as an Ashoka U change leader. 
to help operationalize the social innovation in the curriculum agenda. And as Chris mentioned, um, over 80% of our courses now have social innovation embedded in them. And in the School of Business and Law, in fact, 100% uh, of courses have social innovation embedded in them. So this is fantastic. Um, Deb's been an academic with over 20 years experience teaching in health, nursing and clinical leadership and fitness in both clinical and academic and vocational education with a strong focus in developing education pathways. Now, Deb's a registered nurse and has a postgraduate degree in health science and graduate certificates in critical care, acute clinical nursing, tertiary education and health management. She's got multiple publications to her name and two book chapters and is an experienced presenter and public speaker. So welcome, Deb. We can't wait to hear from you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Steve, and thanks everybody for attending today. Um, as my very long and boring bio does say, I have been involved with CQU for many, many years and do have a very strong passion around the social innovation and social enterprise area. But my primary role has been developing short courses at CQU in health uh, and then uh, a couple of years ago expanding out into um, other courses and micro-credentials across the whole of the university. So we now have a platform that offers 300. Um, next slide, please, Steve. So in the last five years, uh, our university embarked on developing micro-credentials, seeing this as a vision for the future, for enabling people to upskill immediately, enabling uh, students from across any discipline area, postgraduate, undergraduate, high school, uh, as a public access mechanism to upskill and to provide them with pathways into training and education that they otherwise wouldn't have. So our university has for a very long time prided itself on being accessible, inclusive and available to our low SES and regional and rural students. So my role has been super exciting to be able to then work with our academic staff and our industry partners to offer these short courses. So we offer, like I said, around 300 micro credentials. They add value to our students. They add value to our prospective and current students, as well as providing professional development and upskilling for our alumni and any industry partners. And we pride ourselves on engaging with industry directly to host courses for them to help improve their status um, in social innovation. The first 1000 days was a project that we developed with a previous chancellor, um, the Honourable Stan Jones, along with Dr. Frank Oberclade from Melbourne University and the Royal Children's Society in Melbourne uh, to provide education for everybody, primarily aimed at our students on the importance of nurturing the first thousand days of, of a child's life, which will then impact their adult futures. And these micro-credentials, this micro-credential has been offered across disciplines to all of our CQ University students. The feedback has been quite astounding. Next slide, please, Steve. Thanks. So professional development as a focus at CQ University has been primarily around the student experience, and that is not necessarily a CQ University enrolled student. Our students come from everywhere. We have, we have over 76,000 students have been through our micro-credentials platform from over 80 countries around the world. So the students can access material in a flexible and inclusive manner. We apply universal design principles to the development of our micro-credentials, and all of our micro-credentials are also, also aligned to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, indicating where their, their goal sector is and, importantly, aligning to goal number four being quality education. But also, the application of what they do with that micro-credential afterward has been really important to us, and that means we engage regularly with industry. We provide quality curriculum aligned to industry standards, and we make it affordable for organisations to work with us to be able to upskill their students or their staff. Next slide. So as a summary, very quick presentation for me today. The Centre for Professional Development, we've actually been part of CQ University since 1983. At the year 2022, we are now emerging as a leader in higher education across 40 universities with the development of our micro-credentials, which are all awarded a digital badge, can be shared on your social media profile or your LinkedIn profile. We pride ourselves on the industry and community collaboration that we undertake, the fact that we can build bespoke micro-credentials uh, based on any topic of any need, and that we actually host micro-credentials for organisations. 
But most of all, because we provide this education that's needed, especially in this COVID, post-COVID, actual COVID world, and pathways to qualifications and access to professional development, and allow people to experience university life who otherwise wouldn't have had access. And that's about it from me, I think, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. That was great. Good to, really great to hear about the Centre for Professional Development and celebrating, if my maths is right, 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. So next up, we're going to hear from Associate Professor Olaf Muehling, who um, is involved in sustainable innovation at Central Queensland Uni, uh, working in the School of Business and Law, as I mentioned earlier. So Olaf is a health and social psychologist and formerly a research fellow at the Centre for Work, Organisation and Wellbeing. His PhD studies examined the difficulty of achieving, sustaining and measuring attitude change. Olaf's the head of course Sustainable Innovation at CQU and is a programme leader of the Future Leaders Programme at the Fight Food Waste CRC, leading the Research High Degree Development Programme. And with over 50 peer-reviewed journal publications, plus 15 book chapters and multiple expert witness and commissioned reports, Dr. Muehlink is an experienced mixed methods researcher and we're really excited to have you with us, Olaf, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much, Steve. And uh, again, you know, when it's read out, it doesn't sound nearly as good, does it? Um, yeah, look, it's great to be here. Um, might just pop the first slide on Steve. And as uh, Steve referred to, um, you know, CQU is quite heavily involved with this whole field. It, almost every research project can be thought of in terms of um, a problem that needs to be solved. Some of those are social problems, and they're the ones that I would consider to be fitting within the field of social innovation. Otherwise, research problems can be quite theoretical and dull, but the world that we deal with in social innovation research is incredibly applied, bloody, meaty. Um, I'm involved with food waste, for example, um, and also regional disadvantage, but other researchers, for example, take on things like domestic violence and environmental um, systems change. Now, um, you know, my official role is head of sustainable innovation, which often bemuses me because I kind of think what's, um, what's non-sustainable innovation and what does sustainable mean beyond being just uh, an easy buzzword to slip off the lips? One of the things that I find really interesting about this social enterprise um, development for CQU um, is that it emphasises the fact that you can be a business and do good at the same time. And if there's one thing that the last um, millennia have proven, that the one thing that is truly sustainable is human desire, uh, um, which has been linked to capitalism, of course. Um, when I first visited China in the 1990s, it was still fully uh, behind the curtain and it was still fully under pure communist control. Um, there were changes in the early 1990s that released the handbrake on capitalism. And you should have seen, after so many decades of pure communism, what happened to China. Uh, the, the, there was Capitalism was still sitting there in, in the grassroots of the Chinese population. And China has became, over the last um, 30 years, an incredibly capitalistic, capitalistic economy with government control. So I do think this promise, overall promise in this notion that um, if you link good things to the urge to create a profit, I think it truly can become quite sustainable as long as you keep a very close eye on that you're not causing more damage than harm in the process. Maybe shift to the next slide, Steve. So, um, you know, the origins of my take on, on uh, social innovation go back to almost the year I was born when these two guys, Riddle and Weber, uh, wrote a paper, which, a rather dull paper, which has had an enormous impact on research in social innovation over the last 50 years. And that paper was about the notion of wicked problems. Again, this is a term that's starting to become more common. Now, next slide, uh, please, um, 
Steve, and you'll probably find this is animated. They defined wicked problems a number of different ways, and Steve, you can roll through the five things. They said that um, they came up with 10 defining conditions of, and I've just picked five of, I think maybe six here, six of the key conditions of what a wicked problem is. That wicked problems are very difficult to understand in the first place, and that it is only in the solving of those problems that you get to a full understanding of what the problem was in the first place, which is really thorny. We don't know when a wicked problem has ended, and very rarely do wicked problems end. And solutions to wicked problems often create new problems. Uh, so you find yourself chasing problems uh, like a, a dog ch chases its tail, because wicked problems keep on shifting as we solve them. And every time you solve a wicked problem, uh, you'll find that the problem has so much changed that even if you try to solve it again, you'll have to come up with a new solution to it because it sits within an ecosystem of human behaviours and you, it's like a pond, you know, you touch a pond and it is forever and completely changed. Every solution that you come up with, a, come up for a wicked problem with a corresponding definition um, defines the problem differently and you begin to understand it differently. Now, Steve mentioned very briefly in my bio that my uh, thesis was about the difficulty of sustaining change in human beings. And in fact, it came out from a um, original thesis idea of looking at um, self-deception in human beings. Human beings are an incredibly tricky creature to try to deal with. And as a psychologist, you find you spend months sitting on the, they sit on the couch and you spend months tweaking the problem and often find that you have to repeat the same solution 50 times and one day your solution meets their problem. Uh, and magically then they change two or three years into therapy. Now, human social problems are even more complex than that. And perhaps to shift to the next slide, Steve, um, what this kind of means in practice is that, um, uh, you know, it means in practice two things. Yeah, maybe move to the next slide, Steve, because I, I think the animations are killing me. Um, if you think that you have a solution, you know, go backwards, Steve. If you think you've solved a wicked problem with some sort of nifty, um, nifty innovation, then you probably will find that it wasn't a wicked problem in the first place. And to the next slide too, Steve. And this is the sobering one, that the wicked problems that exist in human history are the ones that have always existed. So governments are particularly obsessed with things like, you know, unemployment, homelessness, uh, alcoholism and drug use, um, you know, racism, sexism, domestic violence. Notice that every single one of these is a major current human obsession. Go back 50 years, same, same thing. So it's, it, it is possible to get very um, pessimistic when thinking about solutions for wicked problems. But remember that governments only care about incremental improvements because incremental improvements are better than no improvements at all. Um, and I find within the university sector, for those of you listening um, from within CQU, keep this in mind that th this field of social innovation is a very fertile and rich field of possibility for grant uh, and research applications because government is sitting on this problem, spending each year probably over half of its budget on wicked problems. So half of Australian taxes go towards wicked problems. Roughly 5 7% go towards one wicked problem alone, which is drug use. And huge chunks go to things like defence or crime or homelessness or housing. If you think about it, 50% is probably on the light side. So any solution that you can come up with your research that proposes even a small nudge to these very stubborn problems will get government funding very excited. What does this mean for outside the university, for those of you listening? Um, 
a social innovation approach is not a simple approach. You know, we don't simply say a social innovation approach to a wicked problem is simply not, oh, well, put in a policy, ban it, and it will go away. Because as we understand social innovation, problems don't go away because you want them to go away. You will need to understand that problem very thoroughly in the first place. How the system basically is supporting the sustaining of that problem. Why is it that domestic violence doesn't go away? Why is it that homelessness doesn't go away? It's not as if we don't try to deal with the Indigenous disadvantaged problem. The government's trying, we're just not succeeding. So we are misunderstanding the problem in the first place. So as researchers, it's our job to put aside prejudice and start to truly unpack what the problem really is and what's sustaining that problem, what's holding that problem up. And once you understand what's causing that problem to persist, you can begin to create an innovation, a method of cracking that problem, even if it's only incrementally, and even if it's only, as Rittle and Weber said, for a brief time. You know, we can't solve all problems for all time, but we can partly solve some problems for some time. So I hope within my pessimistic uh, quick snapshot of what research and social innovation is, you, you understand that it's still worth doing because the problems need to be solved and we need to keep on fighting them because they won't go away. Thanks very much anyway. Thank you, Olaf. That's fantastic to hear your perspectives on uh, social innovation and research here at the uni. Now we've come to we, recognizing that we started a little bit late and again, apologies about that. Uh, we had some access issues, um, but we're going to spend the next sort of five minutes just on some Q and A's. Now I know that there's a, a question that Deb wanted to respond to in the Q and A. Thanks, Steve. Yes, from Sarah, um, asking about is there anything for First Nations history and health? Um, so, yes, Sarah, we actually are developing at the moment uh, a range of micro-credentials with the Office of Indigenous Engagement. The first two are cultural competency. There'll be one for staff and one for students. And then next year we'll be working on a series of um, micro-credentials based on working with Indigenous students, um, partnering with Indigenous or First Nations communities, some topics in Indigenous health and culture. So stay tuned. Great, thank you. Uh, and I think there's another question that's just come in. Oh, it's a thanks. <laughs> Sarah awesome. says thanks. <laughs> so if anybody else has got a question, please feel free to pop it into the Q&A now and, um, and the panellists will endeavour to answer that. Uh, Gemma asks, will the materials from the session be available to download? That There will be a record, there is a recording made and we'll um, make that available Absolutely, we will. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? We're, we're a little bit early, so I'd like to ask the panellists the question. So given that CQ Uni was certified as uh, a social enterprise because of the additionality that we, um, that we create in social impact on top of our educational offerings, why do you think that this is important for an educational institution to do this? And how could other institutions follow suit? I'll leave that for, um, perhaps Chris could um, have a go at that. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's interesting actually, when I have conversations with people out there in the world, people who don't work in this sector, a lot of them uh, say things to me like, oh, well, you know, universities aren't what they used to be you know it's all for profit it's all about the big salaries at the top it's all about you know um it's not about social good anymore um putting our social innovation credentials and our social innovation focus right at the heart of what we do means that even if we are in a in a context in an operating context where we have to be motivated by the bottom line and we have to operate more like a business we can still put that social good at the forefront of our operations and uh, and we can do it in a way that it is core business because as a social enterprise, we can actually derive revenue from it. Uh, we can build capacity among 
among our uh, our lecturers and teaching staff to use social innovation as a as a differentiator. Different, sorry, I can't talk properly. Um, differentiator or, or a point of difference in the market. So, so I think there's clear benefit for us to to embark on this journey. I'd like yeah, to and add I would to second that. that. Uh, just quickly, Deb, I, I would second it as in um, in terms of recruitment of students that CKU gets. Um, even at doctorate level, we get high quality students who are attracted to CKU ahead of the of the sandstone universities because they recognise we're different in that regard. Sorry, Deb. No, I agree totally. I am um, going back to something that Chris said, you know, I often get asked, why are you developing micro credentials? It's not core business. Um, I don't think we actually have the term core business at our university. We have core engagement and education is simply one arm of that. Research is another arm of that. Working with communities uh, and industry is another arm of that. So I think the, the world of universities is changing. And as part of an overall corporate sector, as part of every other corporate sector in Australia, we do have a responsibility as human citizens to, to work together with our other organisations and communities to do good. Uh, so I think we need to change the term core business to core engagement. Right. Thank you. Thanks all. Uh, last question, I think. Uh, Mary asked, Deb, is the first 1,000 days course available to people outside of CQ Uni? Oh, most definitely it is. So the first 1,000 days is a completely free three-hour micro-credential available on our platform on Be Different. So, Mary, you could pop that in the chat, perhaps the, the link to the, the uh, Be Different platform. It's open to high school students, community partners, anybody with an internet access can set up an account uh, and can start studying that micro-credential. Um, I have to say it's very interactive. It's engaging. We actually had a stream of students go through as our test cases from every discipline at CQU to provide feedback to make sure that it was relevant for all sectors. And it's been promoted widely both in Australia and internationally. So highly recommend. Great, thank you, Deb. Now, uh, last question. This is definitely the last question from Cal. Um, thanks for the presentation. Would I like to see whether social enterprise ecosystem mapping is an activity that CQU has been involved in? And if so, have we had any difficulties in honing in on organisations that are social enterprises and whether they perceive themselves as social enterprises or, or other? Uh, that's a great question, Cal. We have done some social uh, ecosystem mapping uh, in the Central Highlands um, and as part of the grant that Chris mentioned at the beginning of this um, webinar, we'll be doing ecosystem mapping in the four regions that we're working in shortly in Bundaberg, Cairns, Darling Downs and Rockhampton. There's always issues I find in uh, flushing social enterprises out of cover because sometimes people don't recognise that they're a social enterprise. But I think if people are looking for social enterprises, the best place to look is on the Queensland Social Enterprise Council website if you're in Queensland because they list social enterprises by their region. So uh, encourage people to pop on to qsec.org.au um, and have a look over there. Now, uh, I'm just going to go over to the last couple of slides because we have some more information here. If you click or take a picture of the screen, or sorry, just take your camera up to the screen, um, use that QR code and you'll be able to uh, get to the uh, I Activate Accelerator page, uh, which will give you a bit more information on the accelerators that we're going to be running in Bundaberg from September and Cairns, and then as we mentioned, Darling Downs and Rockhampton next year. So really encourage anybody who's interested to head over, use that QR code or use the web address of cqu.edu.au slash iActivate or just Google iActivate CQU, it will come up. Um, and um, eventually you will get to my email address some way or other and I will be able to talk to you. So um, please do that if you're interested in social enterprise. Now the last slide is, and it's dead on one o'clock, so I'd love to finish here, is if you could, uh, use this QR code and give us some feedback 
about the event today. We'd really, really love to hear because obviously it helps us just create more and better events every year at the Festival of Change. So thank you everybody for attending. It's been fantastic to spend the last hour with you and I hope that you learned a bit about CQU as a social enterprise. And thank you to our panellists for giving up your time so generously. Thank you.